welcome to the Motivated Martial Arts Podcast. Your hosts, Jackson White and Gavin Cook, have been friends and Taekwondo training partners for over 40 years. This podcast will bring you a mixture of their life stories, martial arts, and business experiences to motivate you in life and throughout your martial arts journey. Adding in a mixture of inspiring interviews and some of the best traditional martial artists around today. So over to your hosts, the Motivated Martial Artists. Welcome to the Motivated Martial Artist Podcast with me, Gavin Cook. And me, Jackson White. And we're on to part two with Melody Johnson. So we're still sit, uh, sitting at a lovely house overlooking Tampa Bay. Yes. I'm going to get it right this time. <laughs> <laughs> um, and this podcast really is about um, skills. So this is, uh, this is Melody's, Melody's business. She's CEO of uh, Skills Worldwide, which is a, a children's uh, development um, program uh, specifically for martial arts. Um, and we're going to sort of delve into a little bit of detail about uh, about skills today. So, Jackie, do you want to do the first question? Yeah, sure. So, Melody, skills in the UK, it's, it's been around a, a little bit of time. As the motivated martial artist, we're now really looking at, at pushing that and getting the benefits out to our, our instructors. So, so, can you, from your words, tell us what skills is all about? So, skills came about after teaching martial arts for five years in owning my school and assessing where our retention was high, where our retention was low, based on age and rank. And at the same time, I was also doing consulting for NATMA, which is a consulting company uh, that was in the United States 20 years ago. And they did a survey with their martial arts schools and said, what's the largest dropout age and rank? And based on the survey, they said the largest dropout rate was at Greenbelt, and we talked about this earlier, that yeah, sure. mid-level is when a lot of people drop out. Sure. And they said, now, what age is the largest dropout rate, um, age as, as it pertains to a children's martial arts class, which is, at the time, was 7 to 12-year-olds? And they said, that most of my martial arts schools said the 12-year-olds were dropping out at Greenbelt because they were losing interest, which means that it was getting too easy. And they said, well, what's the second dropout age? And they were like, ironically enough, or, or coincidentally enough, it was also Greenbelt seven-year-olds. And they were dropping out because it was now getting too hard. So when we were looking at our martial arts classes, we noticed that, that your older kids were dropping out at Greenbelt because they were losing interest, it was getting too easy. The younger ones were dropping out because it was getting too hard at the same belt level. So martial arts schools were essentially running a roller coaster class. So they were making the class challenging enough to, keep, to try to keep the 12-year-olds engaged, but then the seven-year-olds can keep up, so they would drop it out, and then they'd slow it down and make it simplified for seven-year-olds, but then the older kids were losing interest because it was too easy, so they were dropping out. And that's really when skills started developing because I said, how, well, how do we fix that? And what I started realizing is that they were in a totally different stage of development. So seven-year-olds are in the second grade. They are, they're, they're writing in script for the first time, but it doesn't mean that they have really good handwriting in script. 12-year-olds now have five years of experience writing scripts, so their handwriting is really good. And if you take that analogy to how they are as a martial arts practitioner, their sidekicks are going to be very different, right? Because a seven-year-old sure. is building fine motor skills. So what I did is I started to look at you know, what skills are they building in each particular stage of their development and did a reverse training concept. So martial arts, we anticipate that as they train in martial arts, they'll, they'll build focus, they'll build coordination, they'll build balance through their martial arts training, but it, it doesn't directly correlate to them actually developing that balance. So what I did is I said, well, let's identify what skills they're building at each age and then put martial arts in that way. So it's a reverse training concept. Okay. So we use martial arts as a vehicle to help develop skills that are appropriate for their stage of development. Okay, really interesting. So from your own experiences, how have you seen this benefit uh, children within, within your own schools? Well, what we noticed is by now targeting their stage of development and skills that are specific for their age group, that we can now show measurable results in each one of those skills to the point that, for example, a, a five-year-old, the average five-year-old can only do five kicks without putting their foot down. Mm -hmm. That's, the, that's their, their balance threshold. The average, the, the, the average Gavin can only do right, five yeah, as well. Right. <laughs> yeah, here we go. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> So the average Gabby can do five kicks without putting his foot down, but then you may have an anomaly like, like Jackie, and he can do 50, but he's an anomaly, right? <laughs> yeah, of course. <laughs> and so in the skills program, we start at white belt, they have to do, for their balance requirement, they have to do five kicks. Next belt level, they have to do 10. 
and then 15 and 20, so that after nine belt levels, they have to do 50 kicks without putting their foot down. So what we did is we took the average child and turned them into an anomaly for that yeah. particular skill. Okay. So we're putting them in the top 5% of their stage of development. So that's the biggest benefit that we see is the measurable results through the program. Yeah. Okay, so as a, as a parent, what benefits will, will, would you expect to see your, ch your, your child developing in, from undertaking the skills syllabus? Well, one of the things that skills does really well is it helps develop the child as a whole. So they have, they, they're getting physical, intellectual, emotional, and social development. Where a lot of martial arts schools and a lot of other sports and activities focus just on physical development and intellectual development. Like, for example, soccer. So they're really just building the physicality of playing soccer and, and the intelligence on how to play the game. What skills does is we also target their social and emotional stage of development. So we tell the parents we help them develop, helping develop their child as a whole. They really like that. And a lot of parents don't necessarily, the majority of parents don't necessarily really need their, want their child to learn kicks and punches. They bring them to martial arts to develop confidence, to develop discipline and focus, and they build that through martial arts training. So what we did is we said we're a child development facility, so we help develop these skills. And we just use martial arts as a vehicle. Sure. And parents enjoy that now because it's easier to market, hey, we're a child development facility. We use the, the excitement of martial arts to help develop your child as a whole versus, hey, we're a martial arts school and they're going to train in martial arts and build discipline and focus and so forth. The first one is more marketable than the second one. Sure. So, um, so what are some of the modules that, uh, the, that you do with this, within the skills? Talk us through some of the modules that are on the, uh, the skills platform, Melody. The, the memberships? Yeah, no, no, the, the, actual, the actual modules. The actual the, yeah, yeah, program, sorry. Well, skills has evolved over the last 10 years, so now we have uh, programs for all ages and ranks, which is very cool, and it's all, a lot of it was based on demand, because we started with three and four-year-olds, five and six-year-old program. Three and four-year-old program is called early skills, because it's early fundamental skills that kids are developing okay. in that preschool age. Then we have the basic skills, which are five and six-year-olds. Because when you reach kindergarten, now you're building basic fundamental skills that help you, you know, thrive in sports and activities and so forth. Then seven to nine year olds, which in the states is your second, third, and fourth graders, that's a core skills program. So once you have the basic fundamental skills developed, now you're developing core skills, which is like five motor skills, which is like I said, they're they're now learning script. Then we have the ten to fourteen year olds, which is extreme skills, because once you reach that double digit age, you're developing extreme skills like dexterity and instinct, like we were talking about with sparring and so forth. Sure. So those are the primary ones, but now we have a mini skills program, which is a toddler program for mommy, mommy and me type program, cool. guardian and me. We have a elite skills, which is a black belt curriculum. We have a skill signature, which is gonna be like more of the martial arts performance, uh, imagine hyper meets XMA, yep. meets skills. Okay. We also have skills fit, which is the adult fitness kickboxing program. And then we have life skills, which is our character development program. So you can have a monthly theme talking about these life skills and tie it into mm -hmm. your actual classes. We have parent skills, which I actually wrote for myself when my son was born. I said, if I'm going to be the best parent, what are the eight things that I need to have as a parent to be the best mother I can be for my child? And those are resources that you can share on your social media platform, your, your email list, your entire audience, helping parents become better people. Because... We all know parents come to us, not just as a martial arts instructor, but also as a therapist. Sure. The, the second, third parent, right? They come to you and say, my child doesn't listen at home. Yeah. You need to they, say something to my kid. And it's their mm, responsibility. Yeah, yeah. <clears throat> they, they, they need some discipline. Can you give them that? It, it, exactly. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So we, for example, when a, child, when a parent says, um, well, you know, my child doesn't listen at home. And I say, well, what, what do you mean? Well, you know, I'll be in the kitchen and I'll say, Gavin, it's time for dinner. And Gavin, you're in your room and you're not paying attention. I will tell the parent, what's your level of connection with your child when you're giving them a command? Is it at a one or a two? One meaning you're not connected. So you shout at Gavin, time for dinner. You're not connecting with your child. Sure. It takes 10 seconds to go into Gavin's room, get on his eye level, pat him on his shoulder, and say, hey, buddy, it's time for dinner. You've been spying on me. <laughs> <laughs> I think this could be a good program for Gavin's wife. <laughs> we'll introduce you to her. <laughs> So, so Parent Skills is an educational program that we can provide to parents. It just adds more value to your program, but it also helps really solidify your position as a child development expert, sure. which will separate you not just from your other martial arts competitors, but from any other sport or activity. 
Sure. I mean, I mean, I've I've been with the skills program for about a, a year and a half, obviously before, obviously we've obviously we've now met and everything. And I was um, obviously overwhelmed, really, when you actually look at the program of the amount of psychology that actually goes into each level of syllabus that you do. So, talk to us a little bit about the sort of the sort of psychology that goes into developing each of these programs. Well, when I when I when I got the survey back from Natma and we found out where that dropout agent rank was. I wanted to dive even deeper and, and figure out what other retention issues were we having. And a lot of the retention issues came from anxiety that was stimulated in the classroom based on like, threats, coercion, and punishment when they're not following suit. So I started doing some studying, on, studying up on child development. There wasn't a lot of information out there, and I came across Douglas McGregor, who was a professor at MIT, and he was a, a, a leading psychologist for corporations uh, in the 1950s. And he said, when you look at corporate structure, there's two types of bosses. There's a Theory X boss and a Theory Y. And Theory X bosses feel like their employees need to be threatened, coerced, and punished in order for them to do their job well. You show up late, I'm docking your pay. You show up late again, you're fired. Yeah. So it led to a stressful environment in the workplace. But they also believe that there was the best, best corporations had the top lead leaders, CEOs who were theory Y mindset, where if you lead with making behavior based on desire, they want to come early, not because they feel like they're going to lose their job, but because they love their job so much. Sure. Those were the, the best leaders. And it directly correlates to how martial arts instructors in the 90s, when I was, when I was being taught, that's how we, we used to teach the kids, is we had the theory X mindset. So mm. you show up late, you get push-ups. You're not sitting still. You get push-ups. And what's happening in the psychology in a kid's brain is if you associate sitting still, but if you don't sit still, you get push-ups, cortisol is now being dumped in your brain. It's, it's leading to anxiety in the classroom, stress in the classroom, and cortisol affects learning because cortisol is like fight or flight. So when you have to defend yourself, certain parts of your brain shut down so that all the energy is exerted to either fighting or getting the heck out of there, right? So one of the part, some of the parts of the brain, like the amygdala and the hypothalamus, which is all associated with learning and retention, shuts down. Some of the people who have had the most traumatic experiences in their life, they don't remember what happened. That's a cortisol dump. So imagine if you're in the classroom, you want to maximize the learning environment. So how are kids going to learn if they're stressed out and they have cortisol and you're threatening them with the, if you don't sit still, you're going to get pushups. So that's the theory X mindset. Yep. So theory Y mindset is... Instead of saying that, say, looking at all three of you right now and saying, okay, who can sit the best? Well, Jackie I'm might. I'm doing it. Sorry, I'm doing it. <laughs> right. And now, now all of a sudden you're all sitting really good. And Jackie, you, you, you're you sitting the best right now. Instead of me threatening you with yeah. push-ups, I just complimented you. Now all of a sudden you're like, oh, this feels great. I so think you should, you should, give, him push, you should give him push-ups anyway. <laughs> he needs it. He, he would it. He would. Be one of I, would, I, like, it, I can do a hundred now, mate. I can do a hundred. He needs a bit of a workout after that Philly, Philly cheese stack that he had last night. So that's just one example of the psychology that goes behind skills. Is we because teaching skills is another one of the programs that we have, and using these different tactics to help build behavior by desire, not behavior by fear. Yeah, right. and, and within the skills program, there's a lot of elements to actually help instructors become better instructors, right? Yes. As well, yes. it's not it's not just a case of you know this is this is what we're teaching, go and follow it. It's, it's, you know, you've got planners on there, and you've got guidance, even coming down to voice inflection and things like how you deal with voice inflection within your class and then um i mean like i say it's, it's amazing it's been an amazing program for me in terms of uh, the sort of growth that i've seen in my school through through using skills so. yeah so you know you mentioned gavin just mentioned the syllabus and things that, that are built in how have you developed the program to support the instructor that, that takes it on well so one of the things that I had an aha moment on was back in 2010 when I had to travel to Australia and I was doing these instructor training seminars and I was gone for two weeks and I had a new instructor. He'd only been with me for a year. His name was Andrew. Super nice guy. And, you know, he ran good classes. But, of course, I was the head instructor, so I felt like I had to teach better classes than him and you could tell, right? So when I left for two weeks and he ran classes, I came back and asked the parents how were classes. And the parents were like, classes are good, but it's not the same when you're not here. And I was like, this is not good. Because I can't be traveling and then and have the value of the program go down. Yeah. And then st students leaving, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And that's when I had an aha moment, realizing that there needs to be consistency. So whether it's Andrew teaching, me teaching, Clayton, Hunter, in Georgia, it, it has to be the same. So we developed these class planners that have cohesive classroom integration in them. And we can go into science on that in a second. 
but it basically down to the minute what we're teaching and how we teach is very consistent. So then when I figured that out and created these class planners and we started teaching them and perfecting them, I would travel and I'd come home and say, how are classes? And they're like, wow, Andrew teaches just like you. And then what was even cooler was I continued to travel and how are classes? Clayton teaches just like Andrew. Cool. And Hunter, who's our 12 year old, teaches just like Clayton. And having that consistency was valuable because I was able to step away for an entire year when my son was born and not even be at the school in the school group. Cool. And I felt like I have a lot of energy and a great presence on the mat. And I felt like before I had that mindset, it was like the school was successful because of me. Whereas I developed these class planners, the school was successful because of the curriculum. Sure. And that's what's valuable for martial arts instructors. And we talk about um, like Gerber, Emif. Uh, you know, you want to work on your business, not in your business. Mm -hmm. So if you can step away from having to run all of your schools and have instructors just follow the syllabus exactly the way it is, you can run, you can manage 10 schools. Yeah, most definitely. So you talked about the, the scheduling of the class. Talk us a little bit behind the, the science or the thought process behind scheduling each session. Okay. So we probably all have very similar class planner formats, but we never really understood the science behind them. And what I did is I went, dove into the science behind every part of the class to clearly explain it to the instructor so that they know why behind what you're doing. For example, warm-ups. When you're doing the warm-ups, uh, you're, you increase your heart rate, which increases endorphins, increases oxygen into your blood, which increases more bloodstream to your brain. And the more oxygen you have in your brain, uh, the more your neurons are firing, and it's called an electrical spike. So in a learning environment, you want that brain to be firing at optimal levels. A lot of people thought warming up was just warming up the muscles, but what it's doing for the brain has a lot of value. So we explain that to our instructors. And the seven-minute time frame is the perfect amount of time to get that blood flowing and get those electrical spikes going. After that, we do a three-minute mat chat, and the mat chat is associated with the, with the planner for the day. So, for example, today we're working on focus. And Can you spell focus? I hope so. <laughs> Pretend you're, well, let's assume you're a student. Can you spell focus? No, no ma'am. <laughs> Jackie, can you spell focus? I sure can, ma'am. Yes. So what focus does is it helps you become smarter. Raise your hand if you want to be smarter. Say me, ma'am. Mm -hmm. The kids say me. Okay, what we're going to do is two fun games that are going to help you develop focus. Then we're going to go into your curriculum, and then we're going to finish with a fun game. You guys ready to go? They're like, yes, ma'am. So right now you're thinking about focus. Sure. You understand that we're going to do some games to help you develop mm -hmm. focus. And you kind of, now you have the agenda for the day so that they know what to expect. And that's very important because if, if expectations, if, you, if they know what to expect, they're going to be even more engaged into the classroom. And what that does is it's called activate learning. So me explaining that we're going to work on focus and we're going to play some focus games now makes your brain go, I'm bu building focus right now. Sure. So now those neurons that are firing are building these new neural pathways in your brain. So after that, we go into two skill building games. Yes, we say games because children learn best. Everybody learns best by play. Cool. Yeah. It's the most impressionable uh, things that you learn are usually through, through fun play. So we do two skill building games. And during that time, as they're doing these games to help them develop focus, that stimulates what's called working memory. So now these new neural pathways, not only are carving through your brain, but they're creating these protein deposits in the brain, which sets them up for actually learning and developing skill. After that, we go into curriculum. And curriculum is can be your forms for focus. It's board breaking, hitting the targets with the appropriate things, and if they do accomplish that, they earn their focus stripe. And what that does is develops their fluid intelligence. So what used to take an hour long to develop, you can do in ten minutes because the neurons are firing. They created these neural neural pathways, and the protein deposits are now there, and that's called fluid intelligence. After that, we go into our cool down stretching at the end. Where a lot of people thought cool down stretching was just to stretch out your legs, but it enables your brain to download the information that you just had, which is called crystallized intelligence. So now those, those protein deposits create dendrites, which connect to new neurons. And then we in class with a fun game because we want, the, we want the kids leaving, sweating, smiling, having a blast, begging. Can we play a game one more time? Like sure. really motivated. The last thing they remember when they walked out is they had a blast. Sure. Okay. Yeah, so absolutely fantastic. How can instructors integrate the skill system into their current syllabus? There's, we, have a, we have memberships for every different budget and also every school's needs. So, for example, we have a skills bronze membership where it's, it's access to the warm-up routines. We have 32 warm-up routines per age group. So it gives you systematic variety to rotate through. They have enough warm-ups that they, they're familiar, but they also rotate so they're not getting bored. 
And they also get the skill building games. So after we do the mat chat, you can plug in those two skill building games or drills, however you want to say it. And then the end of the class game. So what you're missing from that membership is just the curriculum part. So that's where you would plug in, you do the warm up, the mat chat, two skill building drills. Then you have that 15, 20 minute gap to plug in your curriculum. Yeah. And then you finish with the game. For those people who don't necessarily have a curriculum or they're having retention issues and they're having high dropout rates, mid-level, that's a curriculum issue usually because the curriculum is getting too hard. We've done the science and psychology behind the curriculum that target does reverse training, a reverse engineering of martial arts instead of you and martial arts to build skills. We identified the skills for each particular age group and plugged in martial arts. We have the done for you curriculum. So we have everything from your complete class planner to your nine bell levels of testing requirements that you have to do. And so you don't even have to reinvent the wheel. It's already done for you. It's been proven. We're in thousands of schools in 24 countries, over six continents. So it, obviously it works. And then we have our gold membership. And the gold membership is access to everything, all the programs that we mentioned. Okay. Is there, is there a preferred martial art that this particular system will work with? Well, as, as it pertains to kids, the most popular martial arts is Taekwondo. So a lot of the cr uh, curriculum in the skills program is Taekwondo motivated, but we also sure. have a little bit of ground work in there uh, and a couple of different blended styles that help complement the curriculum to develop the skills. Or where we have our particular form, if it's Taekwondo and you're a Kung Fu school, <coughs> you would just plug out our form and plug in your form. Okay. So it does work with all styles. One of, one of the, um, the new syllabuses that I know you've been working on um, recently is the, uh, is the spectrum skills. Yes. Um, again, I mean, I think... Um, Obviously, running martial arts schools. Obviously, we talk to a lot of martial artists around, certainly in certainly in the UK. And I think it's so well documented that martial arts is such a great, um, great thing for children on that spectrum to do. Whether it's ADHD or if it's um, autism or, or whatever or whatever the sort of di the disability is, um, we certainly see a bigger influx now of children on the spectrum coming into our martial arts schools. Talk us through how that spectrum skills was was, was sort of developed. So you're right, we're, we're starting to see it more and more. The level of children on the spectrum has increased significantly over the last 10 years. Some people blame vaccines, some people credit it to the, the um, preservatives and foods and so forth, but this is the society that we live in today. And for a while, we would just drop them into our regular classes, and some do very well, but some, mm -hmm. some don't, and it, it actually is um, retroactive for them. They don't, they don't develop, it's... Or it is, counterproductive sure. and they leave feeling even more defeated. Yeah. So what we did is we identified eight skills that children on the spectrum both have, a blend of the skills that they have that's unique to their particular disabilities, but also things that the parents want, like attention yeah. to detail and so forth. Okay. And we built a curriculum around those and made it mostly play-based learning again, but attainable for children on the spectrum where it's not overwhelming. We, we consider sensory integration, attention issues and so forth. So the program is not going to be as challenging as the regular skills program because obviously it's not appropriate for the way their, their mind works, but it's also measurable. So they'll grow in each one of these particular skills to the point where you're going to increase their confidence, you're going to increase their skills, skills and abilities, and there's a lot of value in that program. And it's very limited in martial arts. It's only the basic fundamental martial arts. Sure. Because children on the spectrum usually don't have the attention level to fine tune their technique. And the cool part about that is that you can have a you know a rookie martial artist even run the program because yeah. the kick is a front kick is very simple. It's very easy. You could teach a talented martial arts instructor can teach a person off the street how to do a decent front kick sure. in five minutes. Of course. If you know how to do it right, and then they can turn around. Yeah, or base, and, a basic middle block or high rising exactly. block. Or, yeah, of course. Right. Okay. Okay. One of, one of the challenges that we have, certainly, in, in, I have personally, is in my schools, is when we have our, our teenagers, we know how challenging they can be. Can you talk us through the elements of the skills package which help support their development in terms of leadership, mentoring, etc.? So we do have a strong skills program, and uh, that's a leadership development program, and it's a, it's a variety of different courses that they take to help them become a better instructor. One of, them, one of the courses, for example, is the stages of development. So we break down each age group, the three and fours, the five and six, the seven and nine, and the ten and up, and we list out the physical, intellectual, emotional, and social expectations that you should have for each particular age group, and then also goals you should have. Because a lot of times you'll experience 
uh, something in the classroom and you blame it on the deficiency of the child yep. or you get demotivated and think that you're not doing a good job as an instructor and that's where we lose a lot of our younger instructors. They, they get scared to be on the mat and have that presence mm-hmm. and teach because of all these experiences that they have on the mat. Sure. So when you spell out the expectations and they go, oh, it wasn't me and it wasn't the kid. So let me give you an example. In a three and four year old class when you're having to just do regular punches and, and a horse dance, and most of the three-year-olds will just drop their arms. Yeah. And then you walk over and you pick up Johnny's arm. I think, I think, I think as instructors, we've all seen that yes, a, a, and, a million, <laughs> trillion times. And, and then, yeah, 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 you go over, you pick up their arm, yeah, yeah. you look over, and then Jackie's arm's down. And you go over to Jackie, pick up his arm, and Gavin's arm's back down. And you're like, these kids are lazy, and I don't want to teach those kids anymore. Us explaining what happened, what's happening is they have low tone in their arm muscles. So they're just developing muscular strength. So them holding their arm up for five seconds is like me trying to hold a bucket of water up for five seconds. You know, I, I have tiny arms, so I might be able to hold it, but after five seconds, I'm like, this is getting heavy. And that's what's happening with their, the tone in their muscles. Same thing with their core muscles. So you should expect a three and four year old to only be able to sit still and straight for five seconds until their core muscles go, okay, now I'm tired. And then they start to slouch and roll on the floor. And the reason why this is important is when you explain it in this way, the instructors go, oh, okay, they're not lazy. Okay, when they're rolling on the floor, it's part of their stage of development. So you can clearly explain that to the parents as well. And they're like, oh, you know, he's resting his, his high block on his head. He, he does that because he has low tone in his arm. The other cool part about that is if you have a three or four year old who can hold their arm out for 10 seconds, you can say, wow, your son's above his physical stage of development from his upper body muscles because he's able to hold his arm out for 10 seconds without dropping it. Now all of a sudden as a parent, yeah. you hear that, you're like, yeah, that's right. My son's got strong arm muscles. Yeah. And now all of a sudden the value, that your perceived value of my program goes up because I'm pointing out where your strengths are. Mm-hmm. Are, are these are these sort of uh, tips and things in the parent um, the parent program syllabus? Part of- it's, it's in the stages of the development okay. syllabus that we have, and it's an yeah. online university. So there's a video along with text going over each of the stages of developments. So your storm team can take it right online, yeah. or you watch the course online, and then you host a live event at yeah. your school with your instructors yeah. and just repeat what I say in the summer. Yeah, I mean, I, I've watched some of your some of your videos, um, obviously, um, obviously online, and um, I know sometimes you, you you get a lot of the parents in in the room. They come to your studio, and you have all the parents sit down, and you do that, yes. and you do a, you do a talk to them. Those sort of things that we could maybe teach instructors to do? Yes, yes. So we do a parent skills seminar okay. with our parents and we go over the eight parent skills. I also do the stage of the development seminar with the parents and explain to them the expectations that they should have for their kids. And, you know, another example is like the physical skills of a seven-year-old. They're just learning fine motor skills. They're just learning how to write in cursive. Yeah. But a 12-year-old is now written in cursive for five years, so their handwriting is going to be way more proficient. Yeah. The correlation to that, like, for example, a sidekick. The sidekick of a seven-year-old is not going to look like the sidekick of a twelve-year-old because their fine motor skills are very different. But yet, parents compare yep. their seven-year-old mm-hmm. to a twelve-year-old and go, oh, his, "His his form or his pattern doesn't look as good as, as his form." And you're like, because he's at a different stage of development, his fine motor skills are already developed, so our expectations for him are going to be a little bit higher. And now, parents are like, "Oh, okay, I get it." Yeah, and and this is this is something I was, I was actually speaking to an instructor last week and was talking about the same same thing is you, know, you you're, sometimes you get parents and they say you know he's really enjoying it Mr Cook but I'm going to pull him out for a little bit and it's like well well, well he just didn't seem to be listening or you know he didn't seem to be developing as fast as the other kids or I'm not really sure this is for him and these and it's and it's a common theme from instructors so being able to educate the parents I think and sort of say well you know don't, what your experience is is normal for that child's age and development right yes that and also that's the cool part about the the skills curriculum, the testing requirements are measurable. So you know, we take one skill, for example, um, five-year-olds are in a stage of development where they're just building balance now that their core muscle has been established. The average five-year-old can do five kicks without putting their foot down. If you found a five-year-old off the street who can do 50 kicks without putting their foot down, you're thinking that kid's an anomaly, right? Yeah, right? Yeah. So the way the skills program works is we, we provide measurable results. So white belt, they have to do five kicks, next belt level 10, all the way through to 50 kicks when they graduate. So at the ninth belt level, they have to do 50 kicks without putting their foot down, and they can do it. So we take the average child and turn them into an anomaly with that particular skill so that parents see the measurable results. Okay. So that helps uh, counter attack when a parent says he, that he doesn't seem to be developing. It's because a lot of martial arts curriculums are just one form to the next form to the next form, so sure. you really can't see the measurable results mm-hmm. unless you're a, a fine-tuned martial artist. 
with the skills program, you could see the measurable results because it, it, it progr it's progressive. Yeah, and you can't manage what you don't measure at yeah. the end of the day. You can't, that's great. Yeah. I like great that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 So, manage, no, manage the data. Uh, uh, sorry, <coughs> sorry, Jack, just got a quick question. Just, to, just you touched on the testing cycle. So um, if, I'm, if I'm right, it's a 10-week and a 12-week testing cycle. I know it's certainly in our schools and the syllabus that we currently run, we tend to work on a three-month mm -hmm. three grading syllabus. Um, so are there different, you know, what sort? So you have the 10 and you have the 12. What's involved within the testing? We, so we, we give you two options. We have a, a 10, as you mentioned, there's a 10-week testing cycle that you can use or a 12-week testing cycle. So the skills program has eight skills per age group, and you cover one skill per class, rotating through each skill in order. So if you're doing classes two times per week, you're covering two skills per class. So in one month, you cover all eight skills, and then we repeat it again, so that's eight weeks. And then on a 10-week cycle, the, um, the ninth week is review week, and you test at the end of review week, and then the 10th week is what we call fun week, where all we do is we play games, we take a break from the curriculum, they can bring their friends in the class, which is awesome because now, now, it, now their friends take class during fun week and it's games, so it's not interrupting, interrupting yeah. your martial arts program, and they, and they get excited about, wow, this was fun, and then a new testing cycle starts next week, so if you really want to start, now yeah. is the time to start. Yeah. So that's a 10-week cycle. The 12-week cycle is similar, except for the first eight weeks, obviously, we repeat the skills twice, and then on week nine and 10, we cover the skills in pairs, and then you have your review week, and then your fun week. Okay, so you, you don't tend, do you tend to take students in your school at any time, or do you just tend to wait until before the testing cycle has you can. started? So, so for each skill, there's a requirement that you have to meet, and that's during the, the curriculum part after we do the skill building drills in class, we'll run them through the curriculum. And if they can perform the curriculum at a satisfactory level at that time, they earn their skill strike. And they have to earn all eight stripes to be eligible to test. So within the cycle, you have two shots at earning the skill stripes during the first eight weeks, and then you have the review week. So you know you're ready. But the way the, way the white belt curriculum works is it's highly attainable. We make it so that the average child can do them. So as long as they're jumping in from like week one through four, they still will be eligible to test. If not, they jump in, they earn their stripes, they wait for the next testing cycle. Okay. What, what, would, be, what would be your advice to um, instructors that are maybe considering thinking about the skills program, but they, they're a bit like myself and Jackson. We come from an old school martial art background and we're like, no, we want to keep everything traditional. And, you know, what, what would sort of be the thing that you would you'd say to them? Well, so for schools that want to increase retention and also increase enrollments, the skills program is going to do that for you because it, we put a lot of research and development into it. We know that kids love it, so they're going to stay longer and they're going to refer their friends. So if you, you have retention issues or you have any enrollment issues and you're a traditional person, the reason why is because the traditional martial arts doesn't fit the average child in today's society. Cool, yeah, true. It's very important. Um, the, the other suggestion I would say is... Try just try a class plan. Take the planner, run it exactly the way it is, yeah. and then you see for yourself. Did your students like it? Yeah. Did your parents like it? More importantly, did you have fun? Well, that's exactly what I that did. Program? That's exactly what I did with my school. Again, we run the traditional, and I added the the skills onto it. And my retention in the skills class is phenomenal. And I, I grew up as a traditional martial artist. I grew. Yeah. I started martial arts in 1987 when it was extremely traditional. And I ran a traditional martial arts program in the early 90s, and I started not enjoying it anymore because I was losing students, and I was always frustrated with my students because they weren't meeting my standards and expectations, which traditional martial arts has mm -hmm. very high expectations. Traditional martial arts are really written, were originally written for the young male adults from military, right? And yep. so they're not really targeting children's stage of development, but yet there are some kids who did really well in it, like, like myself as a child. But I consider myself an anomaly. And the expectations that a lot of martial arts instructors have is they compare their anomaly with all the other kids, yep. and all the other kids who don't follow suit yep. aren't going to keep up. But you got to remember, anomaly is anomaly because they're in the top percent of their stage of development. So you're catering to only 5% of kids who are capable of doing what your expectations are, so you're losing 95% of your student base yeah. that way. So we flipped the script and said, well, how do we retain you know, that 80%? And then your anomalies, you bump them up to the next age group. Yeah, sure. Okay. okay, talk to us a little bit about the uh, skills fitness package, maybe. So we, um, we ran a kickboxing program at my school, and I taught it, and I kind of had to wing my planners, and I would search YouTube and write my fitness routines and so forth, and our retention was not very good. 
And then we hired a kickboxing instructor to come in and take over the program. And she came in with this notebook of different planners. And she was so well prepared and so organized. And I took class and I had a good time. And I said, hey, what if we took your planners and fit them into the eight skills concept where we're covering two skills per class and systematically rotate them? Would that retain parents because they have the systematic retain parents, retain adult students because it has that systematic variety? And our skills fit program has been running in our school for 10 years. And out of the women who were in that class, like eight of them started from class one and they're still there. So it's a done for you class planner format that has not only step by step by the minute what you do in the kickboxing program, also videos of how to do it. So you could essentially meet somebody at, at, at the grocery store and find out they're a fitness person and say, hey, you want to come run a fitness program? I'm going to school a kickboxing program. Bring them into your school, have them watch the planner, and take like 30 minutes for them to go through everything and then run class. Yeah. Okay, fantastic. It's, you know, s- systemizing things, in, in, in my world, I'm a very process driven person, is absolutely the way to go ahead to get that consistency and to keep those high standards of tuition. Absolutely. Like I said, I was, I was out of my school for a year and the school thrived without me there because we had the systems in place. And usually when you talk to a martial arts school or, or instructor and you say, What's your biggest challenge? They say system, systemizing, systematizing, but they don't. And a lot of instructors wing it in their class. Mm-hmm. I can tell you what we're teaching at our school here in St. Petersburg, Florida on November 2nd at 5 o'clock. But just by opening up my plan and clicking the calendar, open up my uh, membership, clicking the calendar, and it's already, everything's written out for the entire year. Okay, so moving, moving, moving forward then, what, is the future, what does the future hold for, for skills? So we're constantly developing new curriculum based on what our, our members are, are responding to. So we have a lot of new programs in place. We are doing a Warrior Skills, which is an adult martial arts program because we have the adult fitness, but we wanted to integrate adult martial arts. We have a Yoga Skills program that's in development. I'm working on Brain Skills, which is a cognitive skills and understanding uh, the different learning capabilities of a student. Like normally martial arts instructors either say, can tell you're a fast learner or you're a slow learner. Not, not specifically, it could be you're a fast learner, you're a slow learner. I was just checking <laughs> that. <laughs> but the, what the brain skills will do is now break down the eight different cognitive skills where it's you're great at uh, multiple simultaneous attention, which is like multitasking, and you're really good at sustained attention, which means that you can pay attention for a long period of time. And being able to really identify where your strengths are helps you become a better instructor on the mat. And, 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 a, the mat. and a better businessman as well, uh, or business lady too. Uh, right? uh, uh, absolutely. So that you're not just labeling them one or the other, you're really going into a lot more science and psychology, and the value of that is, 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 is tremendous for a parent. What parent doesn't want to know what cognitive skills their, their child succeeds in, which ones they need to work on mm-hmm. a little bit more at home. Yeah, and I think I think these days, obviously, with the you know, with the internet and, and, and videos, and there's so much information out there but you know free and free information is not always good information right sure. you know so you know i think it's 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 great to have those um have those sort of um statistics and and information out there for this for the instructors to be able to use it yes in their classes you know yes. and, and advise and and um educate the parents really yes okay so, so outside of the, outside of this uh, podcast then that we're doing today where can uh, potential instructors and parents that are looking to get their, their children into, into skills, where can they find more information? Right now, you can go to skillsconnect.com to learn information about our skills program. We are going to be building a hub that is going to promote the value and benefits to skills and then direct parents who are looking for a program to the schools that are offering it, which is something that you guys are planning on doing in the UK, which mm-hmm. is genius. Yeah. Work for, for if parents come to you because they're looking for skills, that's the most powerful form of marketing versus them seeing an ad run through on Facebook and yeah, sure. deciding that they're gonna take advantage of your special that you have. Uh, absolutely. And uh, as as your sort of UK partners, we know we really want to try and support the instructors in the UK. Um, obviously that's why we're over here and that's why we're having these these meetings and um, and conversations to understand more about the skills product and how we can implement it in the UK to make sure that the instructors are getting the best service available, really. Yeah, you're, you're, you're making them more motivated to do their job every day, which is... But we're the motivated martial artists. Exactly. Yeah. exactly. So there's a lot of motivation yeah. 
when you have everything done for you and simplified and it's backed by science and it's proven to work in many different demographics, you're going to be more motivated to show up every day and run classes. Your instructors are going to be motivated. That's one of the biggest feedbacks that we hear from our, our skills schools is my instructors absolutely love teaching your program. They're motivated every day versus being frustrated. Yeah. Um, and then, of course, tying back to the idea of driving parents into your school by providing the information of skills, the parents are motivated to join versus being lured in by a special. Yeah, I mean, one, one of the things that we're really excited about as well, certainly in, um, obviously bringing it into the UK, um, is um, the, uh, the schools, you know, the sort of um, the UK-based schools. A, a lot of instructors do things like after-school clubs um, and things like the Spectrum skills, for instance. I know I go into schools in my area and I have done in the past. This was obviously before the Spectrum skills was around. And I, I teach um, children that are, that are on the Spectrum. I maybe have a handful of five or six children and, and they're, they're, they're struggling. They're maybe struggling at school or they're not that good at PE. So, and, and quite often with the schools, there is actually government funding for these type of, these type of projects. So um, as an instructor, being able to go into the school and actually you know, get paid for doing it and, 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 and adding value to the school, adding value to your, to your club, um, it's really, really good, and certainly with the um, spectrum skill syllabus, they could use that on its own now, couldn't they? A absolutely, it's and that's a lucrative niche market because sure. there's not really anything else out there that that children on the spectrum can do that they're excited about. Sure. Not just excited about, but also helps them develop. Uh -huh. Yeah. As, as a whole, it's it's a it's a win win for you because it's done for you. It's fun to teach the kids love it. The kids are learning and growing, and they're developing, and the government's happy that you're helping contribute to the benefits of your community. Absolutely. And like I say, and like you said before, it's a done-for-you planner, isn't it? Yes. There's no... And I think as an instructors, um, the, the reason martial artists want to become instructors is because they want to teach martial arts. They don't want to be spending all the time planning. They don't want to be spending their time doing their admin, where this is so simple. You can watch videos, you can do your planner, and bam, you know exactly what you're teaching that week or a month ahead, as you said. Yes. So. It's, it's done-for-you. It's turnkey. Yeah, yeah. Okay, great. We're going to wrap it up there. We're really super excited to be working with you as the motivated martial artists, aren't we, Gavin? Absolutely, yeah. And, uh, looking forward to seeing skills being rolled out into the UK and Ireland and getting support from you here from back in the US and uh, t taking this project forward. Thank you, guys. Thanks for having me. Okay, no thank problem. you, Bernie. Bye Cheers. for now. Bye-bye. Bye. I hope you all enjoyed this week's episode of the Motivated Martial Artists podcast. Don't forget to check out our Facebook page and our Facebook group, the Motivated Martial Artists podcast. And don't forget also the Motivated Martial Artists Instagram page. So head along for some extra content, interviews and much more. So until next week, it's bye from Jackson and Gavin, the Motivated Martial Artists.